deeper you went into the pool, the more your ears had to adjust. Does anybody remember going deep into the pool, right? You tried to touch the bottom, the ears were adjusting. So today's sermon, our ears or our spiritual ears are going to be adjusting to how deep we're going, okay? We're going to go do a little deep diving. Is that okay? My wife and I went scuba diving for the first time in our marriage, and this was a couple months ago. And uh, they actually, in Mexico, you can get certified and dropped in the deep end of the ocean in one day. And so we thought that was a great idea. And um, we're in a pool, and, and they got the scuba gear on us, and they're like, you're going to learn in this pool. And so they dropped me in there, and, and I, I just had a hard time adjusting my ears. And so my ears had pain in them, and they're just like, well, just blow on it, but don't blow too hard. And, and you know, you, all those thoughts in your mind, did I blow too hard? Did I, are, is my brain leaking? Like, what's happening now? Right? Because the pain was there. And so it took me longer than my wife. And for, for you that are married, who here is competitive? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. She was going deeper, faster. And it, it was bugging me, but I didn't want to hurt anything. So I had to wait. And the instructor said, wait until you feel the pain go away and then go deeper. All right. And so I'm telling you all this because eventually we got into 30 feet ocean water, but she was down there waiting on me going, hey, you know, what's going on? What's what? And it took me a long time to get down. So unfortunately, I lost in the marriage world. But how many of you know that if you lose and you're married, you really win. Anybody? Yeah, yeah. I've been married long enough to know that. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to John 17. John 17. And today we're talking about knowing the Father. In John 17, it says Jesus is praying, and he's praying at the end of his ministry. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, talking about himself, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus is praying this prayer saying, I am the eternal life. You are the Father. He's praying this so that, how many of you ever prayed something or spoken something so that others could hear? When you have kids, you pray sometimes and you're hoping that they hear because you're getting the involvement with them. And that's what he's doing with his disciples right now. Is he's praying. He's wanting them to understand that knowing him and knowing the Father is eternal life. And maybe we heard in teaching that eternal life is getting to heaven. And that's just not the case. That's not the case for Jesus. That's not the case in the Bible. Eternal life is knowing the Father and knowing the Son. And there's this wonderful journey that you and I get to go on because I've been married 26 years and I still don't know my wife to the fullest that I could know. I didn't know that she was a better diver than I was. And so we're still going on adventures. We're doing things together in the same way you're going to do adventure with Jesus and with the Father and he's going to take you on adventure and you're going to be like, I didn't even know I could do that. You're going to do that with him. Amen? All right. So I'm setting this up because we're understanding what eternal life is, and knowing the Father is a journey for all of our Christian walk. For the rest of your Christian walk, we're going to get to know Him. He's so amazing. In fact, when there's no awe in our life, like when we're not amazed by God, something's been wounded in our soul. Let me say that again. When we're not in awe or in wonder, and we're not amazed at things God's doing, something's been wounded in our soul. And so when we get before the Lord, we can ask the Lord, I want to be amazed. I want to, I want to, I want to have that, that y'all remember when you first got saved and everything God did was just like, wow, there's this happen. Who here remembers when you first fell in love? Some of y'all do. Some of y'all, it's been a long time, but there was this, man, I can't wait to be around this person. I can't wait to get on the phone with them. I can't wait. And so that awe and that amazement is not just from spending time with God, but it's also knowing him. And so we can open up the word and we can know him. And there are seasons in our life where we can get to know him in ways that we've never known him before. Amen. Saul, uh, in, the, in Acts, we, we see Saul and, and Saul was persecuting the church. And if you don't know the story, Saul was actually murdering Christians. And he thought he knew God. He actually was doing it because he thought he was doing God's will. He thought he knew God. In fact, he understood the Old Covenant. Uh, he was a, a, a professional theologian of the Old Covenant. 
and and he thought he knew God. He thought he heard God. He thought he was doing the obedience of God, and he was murdering Christians on behalf of God. So he thought. And so he's walking down the road of Damascus, and he's He's stopped by Jesus himself. If you go and you read the scripture, it's a really cool story because a, a bright light is shining and, and Jesus is asking, why are you persecuting me? And he's blinded in this moment. Like he's frozen and, and, and can't move on. And, 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 and it's this moment where everything shifts. He goes from persecuting and murdering to being completely useless and blinded. And he needs the body of Christ to come to him to explain to him what is happening and the father wants to heal him and change his life around. But I love it because he actually asked someone to go and pray for Saul. Y'all think about this. If someone was murdering people in, in church and I gave you a call and said, Hey, we got somebody that uh, I'd like for you to go witness to. And uh, yeah, they've murdered a few Christians, but I, I would love for you to go stop by their house and, and pray for them. How many of y'all are going to be like, Pastor Brandon, you're crazy, right? You would have to hear from the Lord on that one. I know some, some of y'all don't even want to. Anyways, okay. Oh, uh, so let's pick up in Acts chapter 22, verse 11. In Acts chapter 22, verse 11, let's go there. And it says, now he's there to pray for him. And he's praying over him. He says, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. Now, this is the one that has been praying for Saul. The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, see the righteous one, and hear a voice from his mouth. This is my prayer for you as a church. This is my prayer for every Christian and, and listening to this online. You know his will, you see the righteous one, and you hear the voice of Jesus. That's my prayer for you. I want you to walk away today knowing his will to see the righteous one and hear a voice from his mouth. And we're going to continue this journey for the rest of our Christian walk. Amen? So write this down if you're taking notes. When you get to know the Father, you get to know his will to do it. When you get to know the Father, you get to know his will to do the will of the Father. Amen? When you get to know him, you're going to get to know his will. I remember uh, we were a young church, and we were actually growing at the time and, and had some pretty good growth. I think we were about to 150, 170, and, and I reached out to a local church, and they were a mega church, and, they, and, and I was just looking for some coaching. I had some other coaches uh, um, giving me some, some wisdom, and I was just reaching out to men and, and pastors that have been there ahead of me. And I reached out to a local church, and they sent a guy over, and he had, he had pastored. He was a lead pastor of like uh, eight to 10,000 people. And he'd done it for 20 years. And then now he was just uh, working for this big mega church in this area. And, and so I, I, was, I was ready to just have some wisdom that was spoken in. And he began to talk about how we do leadership. And I said, yeah, we have uh, both women and men as overseers in our church. And he said, that's not biblical. And I'm like, wait, what? He said, yeah, that's not biblical. He's like, you guys are not living the blessed multiplication that you could if you just had men. And I'm like, man, I got to go to the word on this. I got to get back in my scripture and get, get back into my prayer time with the Lord because I just didn't, I mean, I've been in it, but then I got before the Lord. And here's, here's something the Lord shared with me. Brandon, you need both voices in your home. You would never make decisions in your house without your wife. I'm talking about major decisions. All right. I can cook without her permission. I don't know if y'all know this, but I value her voice and it's wisdom to include both. And so here was someone saying, well, this is not the will of God. And this is why you guys aren't multiplying. And, and I was just like, man, this just doesn't feel right. And so let's go together. Let's look at God's will together. Let's go into Genesis. And let's look at it together. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Okay. I need you all to hear this. I have a weakness. I'm just going to be transparent. I'm going to be open. 
my weakness is, is that when I'm talking to someone for the first time and they introduce themselves and say their name, I can complete, I can completely forget that name in five to 10 seconds after the say of the name. And so I have y'all seen the movies. Like when I was a kid, I loved the movies where the aliens came down and then they'd like meet them in the field and the end, the aliens would say, you know, either we come in peace or they, or you're about to be in pieces. Like, but the first thing they said, kind of like everybody's on pins and needles, right? And they're waiting for the first thing that they say, because you, then you know how the movie's going to turn out, right? Like you really, really, okay. It's about having a relationship with aliens or it's about aliens taking over earth. Like, where's this movie going? Right? So you, to hear the plot, you want to know what they say first, right? Well, this is Genesis. And this is the first time that God speaks to Adam and Eve. And this is the plot. And how many of us have forgotten it? Because this is his will. He says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. And I want you to fill the earth and subdue it. I mean, this is good knowing the Father's will. Amen? So let's go into some opposites. Let's go to the opposites of fruitful. Can we show this slide? The next one says, what's the opposite of fruitful? Barren, unproductive. So God's heart for you is to be fruitful. And when we have an area in our life that's barren or unproductive, that's not God's heart. And so the Bible says, resist the devil and submit to God. It doesn't say resist the devil and he will flee. It says resist the devil and submit to God and he will flee. So it's both. I want to resist, but how do I resist? I submit to God. And so by submitting to his will and understanding what his will is, we won't be resisting things that are coming our way from him. You see this? And so being fruitful is something that God has a desire in every area of your life, your relationships, your children, your business, your money, like the things that matter, he wants them to be fruitful and to multiply. Well, I'm just not sure if God didn't just give me the sickness. Well, is that productive? No. And so his, his desire is for us to be fruitful. Does that mean that everything's happening on the earth that's fruitful and multiplying? No. And we're going to talk and we're going to open up and we're going to see this. I, I want to encourage you that this was God's desire in the garden and it's his desire when he gave us a son, Jesus. So let's look at another opposite. Multiply. Divide, decrease. That's the opposite. If, if something's to multiply, what's the opposite of that? It's divide or decrease. It's, it's when it's, it, it's decreasing or it's dividing. It's like anybody seen it in our country division? Is that God's will? No. And so that's not his heart for our country. That's not his heart for our church. How about fill, empty, or drain? He wants to fill you. He wants to come. The Bible says that when we sing to one another, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When we come together and we sing together, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't sing to people at work. They invite me into their house to sell them homes. I, I don't sing to them, but I come to church and we sing to one another to encourage one another. The Bible says to sing psalms and hymns to one another. You can sing at church or sing at work. That's okay. Just no one's asked me to. And then let's go to the final one, which is subdue or conquer. Like you're made more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. That's, that's his heart for you and I, to be more than a conqueror. And, and a lot of times we use the word surrender in church. And, and I've looked. I can't find it in the Bible. That word surrender is not there, but submit is. And so we submit to God. And I love, Jocelyn, you said that this morning. We're submitting to what he wants to do. But surrender is what you do to an enemy. Like, you have no choice. Like, surrender is like, I have a gun in front of me, and I wave my white flag. But how many of you know that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control? And so this is the cool part is that he gives you a choice, because that's what love does. How many of you had shotgun weddings where you had no choice, and you got to get married, and right? Not cool right? 
You have to get married. That's, that's, a, that's a harsh story. If that's your story, I'm sorry. We'll pray for you. But many of us got to choose. We got to choose who we love. We got to choose the people around us, right? We got to choose who we serve. And this is the cool thing about God is he's not making people do anything. Anybody ever heard the song, God is in control? Am I that old? No one's heard that one? Well, there's a song that goes around, and it's usually in a different form. I mean, there's all sorts of songs about God's in control. And, and the world's confused because they're like, man, if this is the earth and he's in control, I don't know that I want to be under submission to this type of God. Think about what's going on in the earth today. There's, there's sex slavery. There's a divided country. There's, there's all sorts of evil that's going on, right? And yet, sometimes Christians are not understanding his will and saying, well, God's in control. And the truth of the matter, as we begin to dig into the word, we begin to understand that we submit and we follow Jesus. And we learn how to trust him. And we learn how to be obedient. Some of y'all, we, we, we know, we've, we've studied over the last couple years that we're righteous, and now we're walking out how to live a righteous life. We're learning how to have the fruit of righteousness, right? And just because, oh man, Jesus made me righteous doesn't mean everybody around, around me sees righteous fruit. And so we're growing in our walk with Jesus. Now, I'm sharing all this because we're going deeper. Does anybody feel their ears popping right now? We're going deeper. Write this down. When you get to know the Father, you get to see his righteousness and receive it. When you get to know the Father, when you get to know him, you get to see his righteousness. And by the way, you get to receive it. When you know his righteousness, the next step is receive it. You are going to have a choice. He's not going to make you receive it. You have a choice to receive it. It's called the free gift of righteousness in Romans 5.17. And a lot of times people see the word gift and they think they have to make payments on that gift, have to work that out to have a right standing with God. That word righteousness is right standing. And so where do you stand with God is important. You need to know his will. You need to know where you stand with God. Because if you owe someone money, you're going to walk across on the other side of the street. And you're going to avoid them. And if you think you owe God, you're not going to be wanting to be in awe and be in amazement of how good he is because you think you owe him. You're going to think, I didn't do enough this week. I didn't pray enough this week. It's never going to be good enough. In fact, the Apostle Paul called it the ministry of condemnation. And he said there's two types of ministry. Everybody hold up the, the two. Let's give the peace sign, right? Y'all do this in pictures sometimes. Sometimes I'll throw out a peace sign because I am that guy. And most men don't know what to do with their hands when the picture's taken. I'm just being real. But there's two types of ministry. Well, what, what do you mean? There's two types of ministry. All across America, all across the world, there's two types of ministry. According to the Apostle Paul, there's the ministry of condemnation, and there's the ministry of righteousness. And let's look at it together. Let's go to, um, second, let's go to second Corinthians chapter 3, 7 through 10. Now, he's talking about the old covenant and he says if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the israelites could not gaze as moses face because of its glory let's stop there first off the apostle paul is the champion of grace you remember he's written like two-thirds of the new testament he understands who jesus is can we all agree okay he's the expert and he calls it the ministry of death the ten commandments now, what is, does anybody remember all 10 commandments? I bet, I bet if we did a survey and everybody had to say all 10, we, we wouldn't remember them. Okay? Y'all are the same people that forgets people's names in the first five seconds. That's y'all. That's me too, okay? But here's the thing. We do often remember the first two. What's the first two? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. We remember those two because we feel like, man, those are good ones, right? Don't feel, that sounds like, that's a good one. Those two are really good. But the Apostle Paul didn't break those in part. He said, what was written on the, are we, are we studying, are we going deep right now? 
What was written on stone? The ten what? Written on stone. Okay. So the ministry of death are the Ten Commandments. Did you know in America we're trying to fight to get the Ten Commandments back in schools? Somebody didn't listen to Paul. Somebody missed this. And I think that because we missed this, we'll go in a place where we're like, well, I need to love God with all my heart, my soul, my strength. I remember on the bunk bed of my son's, uh, he was maybe six or seven years old, and I was just getting grace at the time, but but I was still saying the things that are Ten Commandments, like, son, you need to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God corrected me. How many of you know that sons get corrected? Daughters get corrected. God corrected me and said, you know what? I love you with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength. And you know what that looks like? The cross. And so I began to shift the way I spoke to my son. Instead of telling him to love God, I told him how much God loved him. And so the word began to shift in our home from do more, do more, be more, be more to you are. And Christ does. And Christ is. And Christ will always be. You see the difference? So the Apostle Paul is speaking a different language and he's flushing. Everybody say flushing. That's Greek. That's not Greek. That's Texan. The Old Covenant. Why? Why? No, what, where did we get here? It's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, it must be for us. Now, listen. Everything here is written for you, but not to you. So what do I mean by that? You can open up and you can read through the Old Covenant, and it was written. You can read things and take away. It's written. It wasn't written to you, or it was written for you, but not to you. So the New Covenant's to you. The New co Covenant is how the Lord speaks your language. Now, my daughter helped me with this this week. I think it was last week. I haven't preached in a while, so you guys are going to have to be patient with me. We're going deep here. My daughter gave me this analogy that was like, oh, man, I love this. So I'm, I'm giving her credit, but I'm going to take all the glory. That's how we roll in our house. Just think, you have a child, and that child cannot speak. And so you have to learn sign language in order to communicate with that child. Now, you can speak, and you can hear, but the child can't. And so you're learning a different language in order to have relationship with that child. Now let's go back in history and let's see how God does a miracle and pulls them out of Egypt. And I'm talking about the Israelites. They're his, his beloved people. And he pulls them out of Egypt from slavery. And the only language that they know is fear. That's it. That's all they can speak is fear. He offers them to be priests, to minister, to have relationship with him. And they say, no, 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 no. We're too afraid of you, God. Have Moses be the one. And so all they can speak is in, in this instance is like a sign language. And so God shifts the way he was doing things. Because you remember, he pulls them out of Egypt and he's, he's keeping them warm at night with fire. He's keeping them cool with the cloud. Uh, during the day, like he's taking care of them. Nobody dies on their way out of Egypt. And then the ministry of death is written. And if you read your Bible, 3,000 people die. The moment the ministry of death is released. It's the only covenant they would have. I'm only going to speak this language. I don't want personal relationship. I want someone else. And people do it today. The pastor is the one that hears God. No, you hear God. This is the new covenant. This is, this is deep right here. This is, this is the deep end right here. Because you get to have relationship with the Father and you have a perfect standing with Him. And the reason why you have this perfect standing is because He loves you and you get to speak His language. And fear, guess what? Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has to do with what? Punishment or judgment? How many of you grew up 
and you did things because of punishment or judgment. Who here, that was me. Who here grew up and that was the language that you learned growing up? I'm only going to do something if I'm either, I got a punishment or judgment. There's people that live this way today. I'm only going to give if there's a punishment or judgment. But let me tell you, there's a better way. Because you give from a place of love. And there's this, there's this joy that comes up. Man, I can't wait to give because, not because I've got a punishment at the end, because there's a, there's a joy of being part of the family. Now, does punishment get quick results? You better believe it does. It's the easier route. Do you know the opposite of punishment for the new covenant is? It's discipleship. Yeah, it's discipleship. Even the disciples wanted to, well, can't we just call down fire upon all these, this village? That, and Jesus is like, that's not the spirit. Well, what are we talking about spirits? Because there's a, there's a, will not the ministry of the spirit have even more glory? What spirit are we talking about? We're talking about the Holy Spirit and the spirit of Christ. More glory comes from the new covenant and what Jesus did. It's the new covenant because it's a new promise. We use that word covenant and that means promise. So you're stepping into a new promise. You're stepping into a new language. You're stepping into a new way of thinking. And if you open up the word and you don't know how to translate, but you go in there looking for fear, guess what, you're gonna, guess what you'll find? You're going to find fear. Because even the experts were finding fear. And it took the apostle Paul, who was Saul, to be blinded. And for him to have this face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus... For him to shift the way he thinks. And for some of us in this room, God is shifting the way you think because you don't want to be the same. You don't want to do things the same. You want to go deeper with God. Amen? So we're going deeper as we look into the new covenant. We're going deeper. Now, by the way, he says it right here. If there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, man, the apostle Paul is just throwing, I mean, he's harsh calls the Ten Commandments death. And then he calls it the ministry of condemnation. Who here would like a, a, a business card that says what kind of ministry you're in and have it say the ministry of condemnation? Right? Wouldn't that be nice if people that were under the ministry of condemnation, wouldn't that be nice if they actually told you, right? Had it on their shirt. I'm a minister of condemnation. What would you do? Okay, well, I know to stay away from you, right? But here's the thing, is if you understand the ministry of righteousness, you'll understand what's coming out of their mouth is not righteousness, but condemnation. Because condemnation always points to the performance of man to get closer to God. And under the new covenant, you're seated in heavenly places. And you can't get any closer than being seated at the right hand of the Father, which is in Jesus Christ. You see it? So the new covenant speaks a different language. It's a language of love. It's a language of family. It's a language of discipleship. It's a language of acceptance. But fear speaks a whole different language. It speaks a language of condemnation. It speaks a language of judgment. It speaks a language of here's a line. If you cross it, you're out of my, you're out of my circle. Come on, y'all. Have you heard that language before? And Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And he's faithful when we're faithless. I'll remember your sins no more. Well, which one is it? Because there's stuff in the Bible that says about sins. He's speaking a new language. And it's the language that he wanted to speak in the garden. And he did speak in the garden. And maybe we forgot that he was speaking in the garden. I'm getting close to being done here. Write this down. When you get to know the Father, you get to hear his voice to follow him. I've got one last scripture. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is such a beautiful scripture. I'm going to ask Mary Lee, will you come on up? This scripture right here is saying that you get to have a relationship, that you get to hear. And when you hear his voice, if you've grown up under fear, and you've grown up, maybe your parents were like, hey, 
we don't understand this new covenant thing, so we're just gonna we're just gonna get you to behave the rest of your life. We're gonna put the fear of man and fear of God. With those, they'll call it the fear of God, but it's not really from Him. And they put all this fear on you, and then all of a sudden you start hearing about a good heavenly Father, and you're like, oh, I don't know about this. Is this real? You're gonna have to get to be thinking differently. And the way that you think differently is you start hanging around other Christians that think differently. Because if you hang around somebody that's only speaking the language of fear, it starts to rub off. And you're like, yeah, 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 I think that is how God acts. But you start hanging around Christians that believe in the ministry of righteousness. It's not that you can't minister to those Christians, but I'm talking about doing partnership and hanging out. I'm talking about, hey, uh, we got some single boys in this room, some young men, single young ladies in this room, and you're looking to get married one day. And you need to ask the question, do they speak the ministry of righteousness? Or do they speak the ministry of condemnation? When they talk about God and church, do they get excited? Or are they afraid of God? <laughs> 